Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the All Atlantic 2021 conference site event, Opening Doors for Early Career Ocean Professionals. My name is Eloise, and I'm one of the 25 All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors for the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. And I'll be the moderator for this event today. So this event will be an open discussion between early and mid-career ocean professionals regarding how we can foster opportunities for the early career ocean community. We will be discussing topics such as the different career options in marine science, how mid and late career professionals can be allies to early career professionals, youth engagement, and diversity and inclusion in marine science. So before we get started, I quickly wanted to go over and mention a couple house rules. So firstly, I want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded. Uh, if you do not want to be recorded, just keep your camera off and you can um, get in touch with us and uh, have a conversation on the chat. Please mute yourself if you are not speaking so we can avoid as much noise disruption as possible. If you have any general inquiries or you would like to answer the poll questions that we will have up, please use the chat function. And then for any questions directed to our panelists today, please use the Q&A the Q &A function. And then here I'll show you a bit where you can find. Um, so at the bottom bar of your Zoom, you'll see the different functions, so chat, Q&A and all of that. So um, to start us off, I'll give, we have a couple icebreaker polls to get to know our public. So I see a majority of people are feeling the jellyfish today. Do uh, put in the chat why, why this particular answer or a particular other answer. Just waiting for the next poll to go up. So where are you joining us from today? In the chat, you can also give the specific country you're in right now. Someone says they feel like an octopus right now because of all the multitasking they're doing and having eight arms will definitely help with that. There's people from North America and Europe majority. Hello from the UK, South Africa, Brazil, Nova Scotia, Brussels, Morocco. Ireland, South Africa, very international group today. Finally, what best describes you? Hi from Portugal. Hola from Atlantic Plus in Portugal. <clears throat> 
So we have almost a tie between graduate students and working one to three years. So a lot of early career ocean professionals, which is great to have today because that's what our discussion will be about. Great. So before we get into our topics of discussion, um, I'll just let each of the panelists today give a quick elevator pitch introducing themselves. So we'll start with, uh, with Daniel. Great, thank you, Eloise. So glad to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel Venturini. I'm a non out Atlantic Ocean ambassador from Brazil. Uh, I'm a marine biologist and filmmaker. I'm also a National Geographic explorer and the head of education and communication of the Abrolhos Marine National Park. Uh, I'm heavily interested in storytelling for, for conservation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for being here. We'll go next to Emer. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. My name is Emer. Uh, I was an All Atlantic uh, Ocean Youth Ambassador from 2019 to 2020, and I am now an All Atlantic Ocean Youth mentor. Um, but I also work uh, for Eco UNESCO here in Ireland, and I work on the Explorers Education Program, which is a marine curriculum linked program for teachers here. Um, and I have a master's degree in environmental sustainability, where I focused on marine sustainability. Thank you, Emer. Next, we'll have Tando. Thanks, Eloise. Hi, everybody from South Africa. My name is Tando Mazomba, and I'm an MSc candidate at the University of Cape Town here in South Africa. My MSc research focused on assessing climate models in the Southern Ocean using historical whaling data. I'm also a marine manager at a Met Ocean company here in Cape Town, where we look at deploying different types of oceanographic and meteorological equipment to help different clients understand their oceans for their operations. I also delve into a couple of um, NGO engagements where I help make um, marine content for kids. Thanks. Thank you, Tando. Next we have Uli. Hi everybody, nice being here. My name is Uli, I'm a marine uh, biologist uh, based in uh, Germany and a uh, scientific diver and a photographer. So um, I'm more or less no, no longer doing really true science, but uh, I, um, I founded a, a diving group, Submaris, here in Germany. So we work for NGOs like Greenpeace or WWF and doing environmental assessments in the Baltic and the, the North Sea. But I'm also working as a TV host and uh, presenter for a German nature documentary um, TV series. And uh, for that, I just travel to other countries as well, not staying only in the muddy Baltic Sea, but also diving in some clearer water. Not necessarily warm, but uh, also pretty cold in Greenland and Antarctica. Thank you, Uli. And finally, but not least, Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor Gels. Um, I am a marine social scientist and policy wonk uh, calling in from Washington, DC. Uh, I spent the last year uh, working on the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and now host a podcast, uh, The Ocean Decade Show, that's on the American Shoreline Podcast Network. A uh, new episode is coming out next week on World Ocean Day. Uh, it's all about the Ocean Decade launch. Uh, I'm also uh, in my full-time job. I'm the program manager for the Aspen Institute Shipping Decarbonization Initiative, where we're working uh, to help decarbonize maritime shipping using big cargo owning companies to try to get them to put demand pressure on the rest of the supply chain to move. So happy to be here today. Thank you. We've really got a multidisciplinary team here today and that's amazing and definitely great for our discussions. So with that, we'll jump into our first topic, which, which is all about challenging the linear career path in marine science. And with that, we've got two polls again to start us off just to get um, some public opinion on our topic. So first off, um, do you think there's a disconnect between research in academia and other marine science professions, such as science communication, policy, social scientists, um, filmmaking? Also feel free to answer in the chat as we go along. Thank you. 
And then do you think, okay, let's see one. <laughs> So the majority of people seem to say yes, and then the other half sometimes. So we'll keep this in mind for our discussion. And then our second poll. Oh, that's the only poll. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we'll go into our discussion then. So all of our panelists here today, um, I believe, have a background or started off in marine science or envir environmental sciences. And so um, I'll start with Uli. So you started out with um, marine science and marine biology. And what inspired you to kind of switch to another marine, uh, marine career path or kind of mix it in, as you said, with a lot of science, diving photography and all of that? Photography was always a kind of a hobby for me, but then it became a profession soon after I uh, started diving because all I wanted to do is take pictures underwater. And that's uh, still pretty much my inspiration and uh, motivation today. But what I found out over the last uh, 10, 20, 20, 15 years is that with those pictures, you can actually reach quite a lot. You can teach young people, students, and about the ocean and you can reach the public community way better than just with uh, with basically articles or or written words so the combination is is worth quite a lot and so that's how i got into the documentary film work um uh, community but also just continuing our work as scientists but at the same time doing the documentary ourselves and this is what we basically do today. So we would still work as marine biologists um, and thus ocean ambassadors, but uh, with our pictures, we can actually reach the young people much, much better. So I do a lot of um, uh, lectures and uh, speeches in, uh, in schools. And for me, that's the most rewarding thing because I can actually see after one hour of teaching those kids um, that they've learned much more that they would have in another class because it's just it comes from from reality and there's one person in front of them who has that experience who who's yeah who experienced this kind of underwater adventure for himself and this is very rewarding for me and for the kids as well Great, thank you. Um, and I definitely agree that pictures can really reach a big audience. And you know, there's this saying that a picture is a thousand words. Um, and with that, Daniel does a lot of similar work in um, making documentaries. So I'll let him give his own experience of kind of how, what inspired you to kind of go more into science communication. Yeah, so I, I got a second a lot of what Uli said. Uh, I think there are just plenty of paths uh, one can follow to achieve professional satisfaction when it comes to conservation, especially when it comes to conservation. And I say conservation here because uh, even though it's treated as a specific area of marine science, I truly believe that conservation motivates every single research line in one way or, one way or another. And it might actually be what uh, research enthusiasts uh, are looking after in most cases. But conservation is so plural. There are so many ways of contributing to ocean conservation. I've met people who save the oceans with arts, with law, with engineering, with storytelling. Uh, and chances are uh, the things we're good at might well fit other areas instead of research. And as Eloise said, mine were storytelling and communication. I've actually never felt more of a conservationist than doing what I do today. Uh, Actually, I even understand better what, how can science be actually effective in terms of leading to tangible outcomes and promoting change. 
because now I see through the lenses, I see it from the outside. So yeah, that's, that's what I can uh, share from my experience. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I have a question for Taylor. So why should others challenge the kind of linear career path? We have this idea that ocean science is research in academia, but why would others, why should we challenge that and, and change this, uh, this idea? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that something that I try to tell every uh, early career and younger person that I talk to is the idea of a linear career path is extinct. Like if it even existed at all in the first place. Um, there are so many paths to success and happiness and work-life balance and being able to feel like you make a difference. Like all of that is so crucial in considering how you can make a difference. If you're miserable in your personal life and in the academic setting, then you're not going to make a difference. You're going to publish bad papers and you're going to not be a good mentor to students. So you need to take, I was in, I have a science background. I got a, a dual master's in marine science and public policy, and I'm an okay scientist. I was an okay scientist, but I'm a great policy person and I'm great with partnerships and I'm great at that side of things. And so I would just challenge if someone tells you these are the steps you need to take, tell them no <laughs> and tell them that I would encourage everyone to take opportunities as they come. Did I think that I'd be working on shipping decarbonization? No, um, that my research in grad school was on oysters and in, Ch in the Chesapeake Bay here in the US. Um, so it's, it's never linear. It never has been linear and it never will continue to be linear. And so don't uh, constrain yourself to those boxes and think that success means following some sort of path. Great, thank you. And I love um, how you mentioned that, you know, the linear career path is extinct or has it really ever existed in the first place? Um, one last thing would be, how can we highlight more the multidisciplinary career options available in marine science um, and ocean professions in general? Because I think especially, you know, when you're studying and you're doing your undergrad and you're doing marine science, there's this idea, as you said, about publications and all of that, when really, does that mean anything? So if anybody wants to pitch in on this open question to end. I think, well, I'm still unmuted. <laughs> I can start, but I think one of the things is that, you know, a lot of grad programs have like alumni events or other things, but they don't, they tend to invite people who have, you know, followed that academic career path. And so I would encourage you to kind of do your own research as who's alums of your programs or who you know that have gone kind of different paths and make sure that they're included on these as well. And really challenge the notion that, um, yeah, like I said, there's one path to success. So it's a little bit of your own research, LinkedIn digging. I've gotten a lot of um, my people who went to my alma mater who have reached out via LinkedIn through things and just asked to have a conversation. And that's totally okay that People love the opportunity to talk about themselves. And so if you find someone that does something interesting that you think you could relate to, um, don't hesitate to reach out or ask for a connection. And yeah, take your passions like Uli and Daniel and I have done and then make it fit within the marine science world that you're valuable and what you can bring to the table is really valuable. And so make your own career path if that's what it is. Make your own job. Awesome, yeah. So the new, the new uh, coach, we make your own career path. Um, does anybody else have anything to, to add on to what Taylor has said? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, wh what I see when I'm doing lectures and uh, talking to kids is that they sometimes do not realize that there is another career path, so the non-linear path. And maybe it's also a, uh, an important part for professors or when you teach at the university, just to mention that not every day, but maybe once a week, that there is something like a non-linear path. Otherwise, students won't know. And uh, for me, that was very important because I heard that in my early studies when I went to university, that the professors always, one special professor always told me that you don't have to follow my path, just, just do your own thing and just look a bit further, just talk to people. And this is what I did. And this for me was the most important thing. But today I think this, this, this challenge has, I think it has diminished a little bit. So the, the students do not, not all students do it anymore. And so we have to encourage those students 
to do their own way, like uh, Taylor just said. And I think this is the this is the way to go. They have first to realize that there is something. You don't have to be a marine biologist and just uh, whatever work on dolphins and sharks. You just can do. You can be an engineer and still work in the marine conservation if that is your idea, if that is the thing that you want to do. So um, this is what I see um, in pretty every lecture that I give. Yeah, just just to uh, complement on that, uh, my own experience uh, by reaching out and talking to people and sharing my ideas, I actually shaped my own career path, as Taylor said. So yeah, do not hesitate on reaching out. Do not learn how to pitch. If you, chances are, if you have a good idea, someone wants to hear from you. Someone probably wants to found you, uh, and and this idea might well become a, a new a new path on your own. So, what's to live by? Taylor and Yuli. Great, thank you so much. And this actually flows well into our second topic. What can mid and late career professionals do to be allies to early career professionals that are starting um, their own journey in ocean professions? And so again, we'll have a couple of polls to start off. So it's great to see that a lot of people have been mentioned in the past and have found it very useful. And then another majority have not, but we really, would really like to. And then in terms of have you mentored early career professionals? Yes, and it was a great experience. And then the other half, no, but they would be very interested in doing so. And on to our next poll. So a lot of people said that they've been too afraid to break the hierarchy rules in terms of sharing their ideas. And then as well, a lot of people have often been too afraid or intimidated to get in contact with mid or late career professionals to seek advice. So I think I'll start off with uh, Emer this time. So. What would be your advice to early career professionals who may be, oh, sorry. Um, how do you think mid-career professionals can help er early career professionals um, on their journey? Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, so first of all, um, 
in order to successfully engage young people, I think we all need to know why we should engage young people. Um, so as of 2012, young people at the age of 30 or younger make up 51% of the population of the entire planet, which is the majority of the entire planet's population. Um, so their voices and skills should be valued, but they should also be integrated into projects, policies and strategies. So we find that young people are often viewed as immature or that they lack the life experience to be experts in a particular field. But young people are experts in their own needs and their own priorities, and that is something to not look down at. So it's important to realise that the world will inherit, uh, sorry, the world we will all inherit is shaped by the actions that are made today. So young people won't stay young people forever and they will move up and they will move into situations where mid to late career people currently are now. Uh, so it's important to have those young people on the side of making and shaping the world the way that we'd all like it to be. So my advice on how to engage young people is to allow young people to become a part of your professional space. So ask them from their input from stage one, don't create something and then test it on youth. Actually allow youth to become part of that process from the beginning. And I want to echo the words of UN Ambassador Thompson when he said, reach out past your habitual communities, the ones that you interact with every day. And I think when you do reach out past those habitual communities, it opens a world of new experiences for you. I also can't stress how much young people want to be an involved voice. We want to feel included. We want to build networks. We want to gain experience. And also many of the issues that mid to late career people are facing and many of the things that they would like to change in the planet, young people also want to change. We want to see those changes too. So the ultimate take home message is just talk to us ask us to be involved, reach out to us. We have grown up, grown up in a globalized world with transnational issues that we all want to change for the better. So feel free to reach out. If you don't know who to reach out to, or you don't know where to reach out, it's a good thing that you're listening to us today because you are now connected to an entire group of young people who want to make a change in the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors and the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Mentors. So feel free to reach out to us at any point if you would like young people to be more involved in your work and what you do, we would be very happy to be there. Thank you so much, Emer. And as you mentioned, I do think youth really want to get involved. But I think sometimes, as we saw with the poll, is that sometimes we don't know exactly how or we're a bit afraid or intimidated to reach out. So my next question is for Uli is, what would be your advice to early and youth, early career professionals and youth who may be looking for mentorship? Because you do a lot of work where you go talk to schools. So do you have any particular advice you would say on how, how we can get in contact with mid or late career professionals? Don't write too many emails, just try to get the people on the phone. <laughs> That's probably the best um, advice that I see because emails, um, they, they are easily, well, forgotten or it, sometimes people get too many a day so they can't answer every single one, but sometimes they have the time or they take the time to, to answer a phone call. Of course, it's sometimes difficult to get them on the phone, but talk to them in person or on the phone. And this is, for me, that was the best experience ever because I, um, I, I mentored, I, I was the project leader for a, a big exhibition um, about the ocean and about ocean conservation. And we were looking for people who could, uh, could act as guides during the, the exhibition. And uh, from emails, I never got the, the idea who they really are. But when I talk to them in person, sometimes during or after a show, they just they, they came up to the stage and just introduced themselves. And that had a much better that gave me a much better idea, idea who they are and how proactive they are. And how, yeah, they gave me this gave me a good idea about their personality and their character. And this was the best uh, thing to choose the right person for the right job. Great, thank you. And I definitely think uh, your point about making a call, even though it can seem daunting, it can really make a difference. Um, and just sharing my personal experience that, I mean, 
it is it can be daunting to to reach out to to people and mid and career, late career professionals but it's such an important thing and it can really really help you um grow your own career and all of that personally from my experience when i finished my masters and i was looking for some work and from for some internship experience i couldn't find anything online and this was mid covid so everything was saturated and so what i ended up doing is actually contacting mid career late professionals at um, specific institutes whose work i was interested in and in doing so i got really good feedback of people saying yes you know we don't have anything advertised but we're actually we have a project that fits your profile really well come work for us so i definitely think reaching out to people is such a good way of finding work experience that is not advertised and a lot of work experience is not advertised out there. Yeah, and if you, if you get them on the phone, you get a, an, an, an immediate response. And once you've done the first call, then the, any further call is just very easy because you know, okay, you, you get a yes or a no and they don't bite on the phone, so nobody does. And that's the easiest way, yeah. Um, Sandro, I, d sorry, Sandro, did you have anything you wanted to share with regards to this as well? Because um, I remember talking to you about this earlier. Thanks, Eloise. Yeah, I think I echo all my colleagues here on the platform in that, you know, as um, Emma said, we as young people form a really large part of this, of this working cohort. And not only that, we are incredibly qualified. I mean, when I look around me, I spoke to this yesterday in, in the Berlin kickoff is, that just more and more students are becoming more and more qualified and getting their doctorates. And so it's, I, I think that there is just this stigma of feeling underqualified and feeling intimidated. And you really just have to, I think, besides, you know, searching for mentorship or collaboration from mid to late um, stage career um, professionals, I think look to each other as well. I mean, there's so many of us and we're so talented and so qualified and, um, and we're so diverse in our thinking that we can also mentor ourselves and, you know, co-mentor um, and help find these gaps where, you know, you, you, you want to fit in. But I definitely think that um, mid to late career professionals have this really important um, role in, in, in opening channels for young, young professionals to step in um, because, you know, the science, the science, scientific field is so um, large in its spectrum of age that often leaders in the scientific field field, especially in research, are really old people. And um, to get in contact with them and then to also, you know, as Uli said, to get in contact with people over email is incredibly difficult. Um, and just to show up to their door um, is easier, but it's also intimidating. And often when you even have that conversation with older people, there might be some context, context that is lost between the two ages. And so this is where I feel that mid to late career professionals can really just bridge that gap. Great, thank you so much. Uh, before we go on to the next topic, does anybody have anything else they'd like to chip in? I'll just add one final thing to advice for early career professionals, but it's personal advice, so it might not work for everybody. But the best advice that was ever given to me was join Twitter. And I know that's a really weird advice, but the marine community on Twitter is so lively and it's so friendly. And I've made more friends and mentors through Twitter than I have during both my bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, but what I'll also say is if you reach out to a mid or late career professional, and if they don't get back to you, uh, they don't respond to you, that's not necessarily them being cruel or hurtful, or sometimes they, ha they ha are so busy that they have to prioritize their current workload over responding to you, and that is okay. But there are a lot of mid to late career professionals out there that will want to help you. So contacting maybe one or two, you might not get the responses that you want, but do feel free to contact many, many people. As Eloise, you said that you did, you contacted a number of people in institutions that interested you. Um, so if you don't get a response, don't feel disheartened by it. Keep trying and, and it will happen for you. Yes, great points. And yeah, I think everybody has this fear of what if they don't respond, but really it's what if they don't respond? I mean, nothing happens. It's, it's as if you hadn't messaged them in the first place. Um, and it's great you mentioned, I see Daniel has mentioned that he fully understands that it's intimidating 
uh, but really often professionals are really looking for passionate mentees that they can help out. Um, even if you feel you're not qualified, often passion can trump uh, qualifications. And finally, as Emer mentioned uh, with Twitter, it really is such a big marine science uh, community out there. And I think especially this is reflected this week with all these events and the kickoff of the UN Ocean Decade and VCOP and now the All Atlantic 21 Conference. If you haven't signed up for Twitter, do so now. There's so much happening that you'll quickly um, get up to date. So with that, we'll move on to our last topic today, which is youth empowerment, engagement and diversity and inclusion. And again, we'll start with a couple polls. So the first one is, do you feel that early career folks are fairly represented in number and in voice across this conference? So the main events and the side events. And um, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at the conference um, yet and all the different events taking place, you can find that on the website. We will, I'll see if someone can add a link to the All Atlantic 2021 website right now in the chat so that you can have a look at that and all the events happening over the next few days. And Emer also mentioned quickly in the chat that guess imposter syndrome is so common in marine science, but it shouldn't be. And she's also added the website for the Atlantic 21 conference. Thank you. Just waiting for the last few responses to come in. Suspenseful. So the majority is almost quite people are not sure yet. And that is probably just because you've hadn't had a chance to look at um, all the events taking place. So do have a look at that. So I'll start off with Taylor this time. So how do you think youth could be represented more? Are there any concrete steps that we can take at a local, regional, international level? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, it's easy to say, you know, like get involved, do fun stuff, but concrete steps are how people uh, figure out how to get engaged. And so one of the best things I can suggest is to find organizations that prioritize youth engagement and get involved. So for example, uh, with UN Ocean Decade, these national committees are being formed at the country level all over the world. And as they were being formed last year, I had worked with Airs Far Ocean, which is a US-based um, youth ocean advocacy group and suggested the idea of uh, a youth associated advisory board for this national committee. And uh, working with the National Committee and with the youth, that this is something that's been started up and that now is being considered for all the other national committees around the world as well. So it's uh, kind of a dual approach of finding organizations that are already doing youth-focused work and then broadening their scope and inserting yourself in places uh, where you see the opportunity that if youth aren't being included or early careers aren't being included, ask you know, and then facilitate, help facilitate that transition. It, it can't hurt to ask. Again, the worst they can say is no. And I know that no is, some, is the scariest word, you know, and it's so short and simple, but um, sometimes people literally haven't thought about it and you can bring this new, interesting perspective, um, but it is hard to go at it alone. And so coming at it from a group perspective or another, uh, an organization that supports this kind of youth involvement, I think is really important. Great, thank you. Emer, do you have anything to add to that in terms of how we can represent youth more? Uh, yeah, th this topic always interests me because young people still remain one of our largest untapped resources when it comes to advancing the global marine conservation agenda. Um, so I think, I think I'm gonna echo what I said before, it's beneficial to include youth at all stages of a program cycle. So from implementation the entire way through to evaluation, not only are you getting different perspectives and are working intergenerationally on that project, uh, but also you are enabling that 
young person to gain experience that they wouldn't have otherwise and that then helps them to better transition from early to mid and then late career as well um it also it, just by incorporating young people and representing them more incorporating them into your work you're also giving them the attitude that incorporating young people when they are in their mid to late career stages is important and that they should do the same so you are creating a domino knockoff effect on making sure that youth will be incorporated for generations. So I think simply inviting young people into the conversation and into your work and giving them the benefit of the doubt that they are experts in their field. They have, as Tando says, more young people now than ever are going for doctorate degrees or master's degrees. We are um, very well trained. We just need somebody to reach out and give us that benefit and you'll see that we are just as good as other mid to late career workers um, and maybe even more so because we have the drive to want to prove ourselves. Um, so I think just reaching out and inviting us into your professional space goes a long, long way. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I love that point about youth uh, is an untapped, untapped resource. Um, a question now for Tando. So why does diversity and inclusion matter when we talk about ocean solutions and how can we avoid repeating and mistakes from the past um, within the, the marine science field? Thanks, Eloise. Um, I think where we should all start is maybe just addressing that diversity and inclusion are two different things, right? And often we just lump them together for the sake of conversation, but really diversity is the what or the who, whereas you know inclusion is the how. Um, and as Emma's alluded to, you know, it's we, we don't want to just tick boxes, you know, I'll one up that conversation is we don't want to just tick boxes, we don't want to just invite a diverse youth group, we want to include them and in which means that where they were previously excluded, their opinion is now it's weighted, it carries weight, it's embraced, it's heard, it's considered. Um, and we should definitely be in every part of that implementation phase from the very beginning. And um, excuse, it's really windy here in Cape Town today. I don't know if you can hear that, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we 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 don't only need to be included in conversation and you know our opinion and discussions. Our voice also needs to um, carry weight in voting um, and what actually happens. And and so when we talk about this in terms of you know marine spaces and solutions, we want healthy and resilient oceans for all. And if we focus on this aspect working backwards, it means that we have to include everybody if we want an ocean for all. We can't speak for other people who have different experiences to us if they look different to us or have different experiences. Um, if we look at the female stats currently in ocean research, there is about 38% female researchers currently in oceanographic research, or not just ocean researchers, um, which is 10% higher than just natural sciences, which is really good. But then we need to further look at the intersectionality there, you know, just speaking from my example, growing up and looking at, um, you know, BIPOC, female BIPOC researchers and what are the stats there and how do we go forward from there? How do we include or increase the representation of different people um, in, the marine, in the marine research field? You know, that intersectionality really speaks to different races, ages, religions, cultures, sexualities, genders, or even personal incomes. Um, and even if we, you know, we look at this, this conference today, um, you know, COVID's done a really great thing of making things more accessible. But, you know, before this, when conferences were, were a lot more physical, there are a lot of people who, who, who weren't able to attend these conferences because of, of, of lessened resources. And, and so I think, you know, the stats on, in, the, in the Global Oceans Report from last year says that 69% of, of young people who participated in, in ocean and ocean um, conferences was 69% of them came from Northern America and, and Europe, where 11% came from Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean. And so you can see that that's, you know, that's definitely a bias sort of attendance and we have to look at the whys and then we have to look at the solutions for that. So, you know, a really simple example that I had a conversation with a friend is, is that if your institution um, or your work allows you, um, allows their funding to sort of fund you to get to that conference, 
it's up to us if we are more resourced to say to the organizers of the conference, hey, I can afford this percentage of the of the conference. Why don't you redirect um, my, your contribution to me being there to somebody else who may want to be there? And there's definitely people who want to show up and contribute and learn and share within the information and the data that's going on here. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, in, in closing, representation matters because we want an ocean for all. And the only way to do that is to have everybody at the table and making those decisions. Thank you so much. Um, and actually something that you had once mentioned, I think is that the Ocean Literacy, Fest ocean Literacy Festival, um, you talked about how everybody's experience with the oceans is different and unique. And that because of that, we shouldn't you know, categorize it in a certain way and that everybody's voice should be heard. Um, I see we have a question from the chat. So a question open to any and all panelists. So often there's a need for graduates to do volunteering or unpaid internships in order to gain experience to land a paid job. What needs to be done to change this tendency to even play to an even playing field for people who may not have um, the ability to volunteer and do unpaid uh, work? I love this question. I think it's a great question because ultimately this is actually a justice and a privilege issue because those kind of internships are only open for people who can pay for them or who can pay their way through an unpaid volunteership. So I think that there are two parts to this. There's the part of the mid and the late career um workers and then there's or professionals and there's also a, a part for the young professionals as well first things first is for the mid and late career professionals they need to understand that young people are more qualified than ever and they need to understand that young people do have skills that they can bring to this uh, role that would improve their projects so why shouldn't they be paid why shouldn't young people be paid or have to pay themselves uh, when they can bring those tangible skills to that role Policy changes go a long way here. Um, the EU is, is moving to get rid of unpaid internships and other countries need to follow, but young people have to have an active voice in order to change that issue. And the other thing that a group of, uh, once again, Twitter <laughs> people are starting to do is if an unpaid or a volunteer role does come up in the marine sciences, all of the young people uh, who find that ad post are commenting underneath it saying, I would have applied for this role, but unfortunately I'm not privileged enough to do so. I can't afford it. It's a real shame because I could have brought my skills to this, but now you'll never know. And we're starting to actively try and get the message out there in a non-confrontational, but kind of confrontational way that unpaid internships and internships where you have to pay to do them um, shouldn't have a place in marine sciences. It is blocking off a large number of people who just can't afford them. And they are, I think, very unfair. So I hope that that helps in some way, both from the mid and late career stages and the early career stage too. Thank you, Emer. Um, we have another question for the panelists. How can we reach a larger audience of young marine science researchers and agents? My question is based on a personal experience in which I see that many young researchers and workers, especially in developing countries, do not have this global vision of marine science acting very locally in their own projects. I might actually, um, I can start off challenge the idea that we need to always think globally, that um, sometimes local solutions and uh, are necessary and are the best path forward because you are able to better integrate, I think, that local ecological knowledge, um, the knowledge from users of the resource in those areas that you don't always want or need, you know, scientists from North America or Europe um, uh, parachuting in, doing all the research, coming back and get it like, um, I think that, uh, like some of us have discussed, like Twitter and social media are good ways to start broadening experiences and to think about how the local applies to the global, um, because I think that that's really useful to have those sorts of case studies and think both in a top down and bottom up way. But um, yeah, I would challenge that idea that you need to always think globally because local solutions and local management uh, is, uh, is becoming even more common, I think, in in a lot of places around the world. Yeah, and I think that's a great point about how local applies to global. Um, we also have a question for Uli asking, how many non-paid internships uh, have you done in the past? 
Ah, uh, that's a good question. I can think of three or four. The last two were a bit shorter, but the first one was a bit longer, working in a laboratory in, uh, in the northern part of Germany, which was actually very important, but I found out only a year later because I applied for a job um, where special knowledge was needed. And I just learned that knowledge during that non-paid internship. But of course, at the time I was doing it, I had no idea that this would allow me to join an expedition cruise on a research vessel in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and the second one was on a, on a research sailing ship, which taught me quite a bit, not only about science, but also about um, living on a very small, confined sailing ship space with a lot of different people. And uh, yeah, that was quite helpful in my career. Uh, I think I have just one final question that I can also ask to everyone would be what in your opinion is the most important thing we can teach to non-scientists to get them involved in ocean stewardship? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question because I sometimes get this during my, my lectures. And uh, I remember one lecture that I gave on a, on a cruise ship to um, adults, to elderly people. And I was talking about jellyfish. That's why I laughed so much um, when, you, when you first started your, your first poll. How do you feel today? Or what, what marine animal would you like today? Or how do you feel? And uh, I also feel like a jellyfish sometimes. I love, love jellyfish because they're so elegant and uh, they just flow through the water. Sometimes, of course, they can't control their movement, but they still live and have a great life, I guess. And I was talking about the deep sea jellyfish, which I uh, photographed in Northern Norway this big red blob, this periphyla, periphyla. It's a wonderful animal. And uh, then I got a question afterwards. So uh, Uli, what's, what's the meaning? What's the, the, the meaning of life for that jellyfish? And I just looked at the picture and then I looked at him and said, but what's your meaning of life? And I think this triggered a whole um, cascade of, of questions for himself because then he understood that any animal on the planet, no matter how, whatever, gelatinous or reddish or disgusting it might be is important for for the whole ecosphere and i guess i i convinced him to to have a different look on at his own life and this is what i still continue to do just to to tell people that we have to care take care of of any single animal no matter how small or big they are and this might trigger some people to get involved in ocean stewardship. Great, thank you. Any last final words? Yeah, I think that I could echo a bit of what Uli said just now, is that I think that, you know, now we're at the age of understanding that um, everybody's perspective on the ocean really matters and it has weight and it, it really deserves to be heard. And I think the easiest way to get people to to want to shop for the ocean is just to listen to them and how they how they relate to the ocean. Um, there's no right way or wrong way. Um, I find that people are drawn to the ocean from for multiple reasons, for different reasons, but these reasons are all equally important. I always say to you know my friends and community that the ocean is our common heartbeat, and this is because not only does it have biological function that it gives us, it gives us breath, but also because everybody is drawn to it in some other way, and because we love it so much, we want to shop for it and be a steward for it, and um, we shouldn't feel shamed into in, into protecting the ocean. We should just want to protect it, and that's because. Um, we all have this different relationship with it and we should really harness it and celebrate how all these different relationships that people have with it. And I think encouraging those relationships is the way forward and getting people to celebrate their relationship with the ocean is how we get them to be stewards for it. Yes, completely agree. Thank you, Tando. So thanks to all the panelists for this great open discussion. Um, so we're nearing the end of our session now, but before we leave, we do have some final polls for the public to get your final opinions. So we'll get those out. So were you familiar with any of the barriers or struggles discussed today um, from your own life? So from your own experience, yes or no. Uh, did you gain ideas or learn how to overcome different barriers, struggles that were discussed today? 
And would you be interested in attending future events like this in the future? Um, do let us know about this comment. Um, as youth ambassadors, this is definitely something that we like to do and we want to keep doing. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, so we hope that this event has shed some light on the various career paths in ocean science, whether it be research, academia, science communication, science and policy, social science, all of that and how you can get involved. Um, quickly at the answers. So a lot of people were familiar with, today, with the barriers and have experienced them in their own life. A lot of people have gained um, ideas. Uh, some are still not sure. And then a majority of people would like to see uh, future events like this in the future. So that's great to know. Yeah, so I mean, although this event is coming to an end, we do invite you all to continue the conversation and share your thoughts on idea. So you can find us, um, the All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors, um, on Twitter and on Instagram, as well as our panelists. And we will quickly put up the slide with all the speaker information again. So thank you all so much for coming to our side event. And we hope that you had that you enjoyed this session and get inspired throughout the rest of the All Atlantic 2021 conference. Do you keep an eye out for the other ambassadors throughout the conference in the next few days, because a lot of us are participating everywhere. And as Daniel said, we do feel like an octopus right now with our arms stretched everywhere. Uh, before we leave, I will quickly take a screenshot with our panelists um, for social media and for Twitter, as we do love our Twitter. So if everybody can smile for me. Great. I think I should have that saved. Yeah, so thank you again to all the panelists. And yeah, we hope to see you and keep the conversation going in Twitter and on Instagram and social media. Yeah, DM us if you have any more questions. Feel free to reach out to any of us and we hope you reach out to mid and late career professionals as well. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you.